Join us, friends. Great Scott Spa Guy. Do they know what we have in store for them? They will if they tighten up. And don't double dribble. To the Grey Ghost Spa Guy? Exactly, old chum. No time to waste. To the Grey Ghost. We have not a minute to spare. It's showtime, friends. All right, all right, all right. It is the Spa Guy, and it is... Globe trotting with Trey. And we are not wishing Cotton was a monkey, but we know that there are a lot of people out there that are. Today's a subject. Of, a lot of people that will believe uh, the story that's been narrative of today's subject. Yeah, that's a good point. They'll believe the, uh, the original narrative. I happen not to believe that, and I have a lot of reasons why I don't believe that. Um, yeah, today's subject <laughs> is the assassination of Martin Luther King. Um, and it's, that is a, it's a sad subject. Trey and I, when we do our bus tours, uh, usually in January and, and August Elvis week, one of the things that we actually drive by is the church that Martin Luther King gave the mountaintop speech in. We also drive by the location of the Lorraine Hotel where he was assassinated or murdered, whatever you want to call it. And we drive by, and that's part of our tour is telling people about what happened there that they've never heard of before. And the way that I learned about it was, um, I had all, have you ever been to Lorraine Trey? Um, I've never, no, I've not, I've not done the tour. I've been out outside of it. Yes. Right. But me and you drive by it, but I'm saying, have you gotten, gotten out and walked up to the hotel? Yes. Yes. Okay. And I was always just being uh, being transparent. I was always kind of embarrassed to go do that because I thought that they would be like, "What's that dude doing? What's that white guy doing here?" You know. But I found that not to be the uh, the reality of it. I went out there one night. I think it was a Friday night from my from my memory, and I took my tripod. I took my camera, and all I was trying to do was just get an idea of what it looked like. And I did it at a time when I thought nobody would be there and nobody would be um, uh, feel offended that I went. OK, right. so I'm out there with my camera. I have my tripod and I'm and I'm filming and doing different things and kind of looking around and trying to understand the lay of the land and where the shots came from and all that kind of stuff. And these two black guys and a black lady walk up. And the black guy, one of them said, hey, man, what are you doing? And I told him that I was filming and just trying to understand it. And he said, well, do you know, um, do you know about the guy that ran Jim, Jim's grill in the trial? And I said, what's Jim's grill? He said, that's the place right over here. That's under the boarding house. They say that the shot came out of that window in the boarding house. That's just above Jim's grill. Um, but there was actually a trial and there's a guy and his name was Lloyd Jowers. Right. And Lloyd came to uh, the, the King family later in life and confessed to disposing of the murder weapon. And I said, do what? Are you, seriously? He said, yeah. He said, there's, there was a civil trial. He was found guilty and they did, they made him pay a fine of, I think a hundred dollars if I remember right, but he did it more so that the King family could, could prove that it was a conspiracy more so than to even implicate himself. He was not charged criminally. He was just charged civilly. But he was very, very old at the time. And who Lloyd Jowers is, Lloyd was the guy that ran Jim's Grill. So after that, I went home and I actually wrote down Lloyd Jowers because it's such an odd name. And I put it in my phone and I went back to the hotel and um, I started studying this trial. And there's a 2,800 uh, page court documents about this particular trial. And in these court documents, they talk about um, that particular incident. And then they talk about other incidents that would put uh, James Earl Ray not even at the scene when the shots happened. But it also implicates some other people. There's other things that came out. And that's something that we show you on the bus tour. And I have it on my phone during this, Trey, if you'll remind me to play that. I could play okay. that. So that I think that kind of puts the icing on the cake. Um, so there's, I don't believe that, that there's such things as coincidences. There's such things as happenstances. But when you start getting all these coincidences and all these happenstances happening at one time, 
the odds of it all being coincidence and happenstance goes up exponentially. Would you agree with that, Trey? I would agree with that. <clears throat> and knowing the story uh, that you're going to share today, <laughs> really, I, I really think something else happened uh, to Martin Luther King Jr. than what history has written. And my question is, <clears throat> if that guy confessed to the family, and I, I believe, didn't you tell me that the the King family didn't think that what they say is true. Then you say that yes, they, they think that somebody else had something to do. Yeah. With it. Well, of course they thought it was a conspiracy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> my question is like, why doesn't anybody know about the guy confessing? Well, you know what they told me when I was reading about it, what it said was that the press didn't cover the trial. Right. Why? Because they don't want the truth known. You see what I'm saying? The government does not want you to know that they knocked off some guy that they didn't like. You see what I'm saying? And so when you start looking at it from the outside, just looking at the, the basics of this, you have to really go, what in the world happened? Um, so there's a couple of different ways, uh, a couple of different things that I want to, to bring forth. And I'm really trying to think about how I want to tell this story. So let's start with uh, who James Earl Ray was. I actually have a lady that, that you've met, Trey. Um, she's come to a lot of Elvis events. She was there at the opening of the dojo in a wheelchair. You remember her? Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. And her husband, or maybe boyfriend, I don't know if they were married or not, was actually in prison, and he was a cellmate of James Earl Ray. Yeah. He's passed away now, but before he passed away, I was able to do an interview over the phone from prison where he told me the things that James Earl Ray had told him. So I was able to get that interview. None of this stuff that we're going to talk about today have I ever put out, but I filmed a lot of it and, and I filmed um, over a long period of time. I mean, over years, I would find something else and go back and film another segment, find something else and go back and film. <clears throat> you filmed the hotel that they put him in like a week and a half earlier. Yeah, that was called the New Rebel Hotel. It is still there. And, it and is uh, on Lamar. Um, yes. You know, the World Away Club is on one side of I-240. It's on the other side of I-240 going south. On the left-hand side, it's still a working hotel or motel. And what I did was I went there. Now, the story that I always thought, the story has always been said that, that – uh, uh, James Earl Ray came to town and he stayed at the New Rebel Hotel. He got up the next day, went into town and checked into the boarding house and shot that night from the boarding house and then fled. Okay. That is the story that I've always heard. So I go to this hotel and the guy that owns it now um, had didn't own it then, but he got the information from the prior owners of this. And what he told me was that James Earl Ray when he checked in, he paid for two weeks. He paid for 14 days. He stayed 10. So on that 10th day is when he knew Martin Luther King was going to be there. So he moved from there to the boarding house. But let's back up. Where did James Earl Ray come from? So the answer is James Earl Ray broke out of prison. He was actually an escaped convict. Okay. So this escaped convict was able to travel. He was able to pay cash for a Mustang that was two years old. He was able to buy a gun with a scope in Birmingham, in Alabama. Yeah. And I think what he bought, and I, I could be off on this, but I think it was a 223 with a scope that he bought. Then he went back the next day and exchanged it for a 30 out 6 with a scope. Now, the reason that I believe that he changed to a 30 out 6 is because he talked to a guy, and now we're going to introduce a new character. According to James Earl Ray, there was a guy that, that recruited him, and this is the guy that gave him four passports Okay, in Canada. He was in Canada. He got four passports. So think. let's just think about the passports for a moment. And this guy's name is Raul, by the way. So think about the passports. Back then, you couldn't thumb through the telephone book and go, well, that guy right there, John Smith, is going to – match my physical description, my height, weight, my eye color, my hair color. So how did he come up with four passports 
that matched his eyes, his height, his hair color, all of that. How does how's how can that be done? Okay, that has to be done by it can't be done by a convict on the run. Okay, so that's that's one thing. Yeah, he said that Raul is who was funding him. He even went to California for a period of time and and went to bartending school. And he also, I think, went to dance classes in California. And I'm going from memory, but I think that's right. I think it's bartending school and dance classes. So this guy is freely moving all across the United (laughs) States with enough money to do it and enough time to take classes and do different stuff, okay? Yeah, what I was wondering is, did he break out of prison and just go and get him a hard working job? No, he did not. <laughs> you know, did, 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 he broke out of prison, went to work. Is that what he did? You yeah, know? he was he was living like he was working. <laughs> so I mean, he broke out of prison, and I think he did it with like a bread truck. You know, you <laughs> see that in the movies where they climb under the bread truck, or you know, he stowed away in a truck from my memory, and that's how he got out. But anyway, he's. He's moving around freely. He's able to buy a gun as a convict, okay? So then he goes back and exchanges it for the exact same gun that Lloyd Jowers, the same style of gun that Lloyd Jowers said he threw in the Mississippi River, a 30 out 6 okay, a Winchester. Um, and so all I'm saying is, imagine this. He goes and gets a gun and gets a scope, goes back to the hotel. Raul's there. Raul goes, wait a minute. Let's make sure that the guy that we've got hired to actually shoot uh, MLK, what kind of gun he's going to use. Oh, 30 out six. Oh, I need you to go back and exchange this for a 30 out six. And the 30 out six, by the way, that, that James Earl Ray used is in the museum. So next time we go to Memphis and we have some time, we need to go there. By the way, friends, if you go to Memphis, go to that museum. It is absolutely excellent. It is one of the best museums I've ever been in. They have displays over there next to the Lorraine, but you can also go under the tunnel and come up in the boarding house. And so you can actually see James Earl Ray's bedroom and you can see the, the, um, the bathroom that he supposedly shot out the window. You could see all those different things. It's all there for you to actually see. You can also see um, Martin Luther King's bedroom untouched. It looks just like it did that day. And you can see that bedroom as well. That's part of the tour. It's very, very well done. Um, So what's interesting is he was able to do that. He was able to buy a car and just go and do anything he wants to. So the way this all went down was, and I believe, remember, and and I'm going to kind of of, of tie this a little bit to the the, um, Kennedy assassination. Because I think that it has some similarities. Right. Remember that um, when they got Lee Harvey Oswald, one of the things that he said was, I'm just a patsy. Meaning he was a pawn being used in this scheme. He was not the, the only one or the mastermind. He was being used as the fall guy. And that's what he meant by that. Well, I believe James Earl Ray was being used as a fall guy. He was a, an escaped criminal. They didn't care what happened to an escaped criminal. They were going to use him to get what they wanted to get done. And then he was going to go to jail. And guess what he did? I think that they had him convinced that he was part of this plot. And then we're going to put you in witness protection or we'll send you to Canada or we're going to send you somewhere and take care of you. So the trial goes on and he is sentenced and he goes to jail. On the third day, he starts singing like a canary and going, guys, what we said happened in that trial is not what happened at all. And he starts telling the story about Raul. And he said that Raul worked for the CIA and that he recruited him. Raul's who got him the four passports. Raul is who uh, helped him get from Canada to California, helped him buy a car, helped him buy a gun, got him to the new rebel hotel, told him to go to there. And he says that Raul was in the room with him at the boarding house. Right. Okay, so what he said was that at around 545, I left and went, Raul told me that I should leave and go get a tire plugged on that Mustang. And I left about 545 to go get the tire fixed. I went to the gas station. The guy told me he was too busy to come back later. I started heading back to the uh, to the boarding house. And when I was on my way back, 
I noticed police everywhere because it had already happened. And when I did that, when I saw that, I just took off and went to Atlanta. So he went to Atlanta. Then he ended up in Canada. And then from Canada, he went to uh, England. He flew to Europe. And I don't think he was in England originally. I think he ended up in another country. And I don't remember from, uh, it's been a little while since I've studied this, but I do remember him being in England. And he was actually extradited from England by our friend, Bill Morris. Trey and I had uh, lunch with Bill Morris in January in Memphis at the Half Shell. And Bill is 90 years old and he gets around better than I do. Yeah, and Bill's has like very good, very uh, solid memories of all this stuff. Now, I will say for the record that I asked Bill, you were there when I asked Bill, did he think that uh, that James Earl Ray was the lone shooter? And he said, yes. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think so. That's, you know, and, and I still respect Bill Morris. This is not a slam on Bill Morris. Everybody's entitled to their uh, opinion. My opinion is that this was a, a government hit. So the, the thing that happened that's, that's real crazy about this whole thing is if you can imagine stepping out of, out of a door, the, the boarding house was upstairs and Trey, you've been here before. And there's to the right of Jim's grill, there's a doorway basically between two buildings. Yeah. So what they more or less did is built two buildings, maybe three foot apart, and they built a stairway between those two buildings that goes up to the boarding house. So right. if you can imagine that door. So if you came down from the boarding house straight out that door, if you walked straight and walked, stepped off the curb, you would be behind where James Earl Ray's uh, kind of a off-white colored Mustang was was pointing, heading that way. So you're standing at the back of it. So if you shot someone and you're trying to get away, what they want you to believe is that James Ray was in the bathroom. He shot. He went in his bedroom, put the gun with his fingerprints all over it, a newspaper that said that Martin Luther King was going to be there that day with his fingerprints all over it, a pair of binoculars that he bought that day from York Arms, for about, it was almost $50. And back then, a, a Mustang was $2,000. $50 was a lot of money. That's not something a convict just had money for. So he bought it that day. His fingerprints were all over that. Plus, there's eyewitnesses at York Arms that saw him bomb. You see what I'm saying? So it was these all these things were setups. All of his personal care items, his deodorant, his shaving kit, all that was wrapped up in a bed sheet and taken outside. And what he did, Trey, is he ran down the steps and ran around the back of the Mustang, jumped in the driver's door and drove off, right? Well, that's what <laughs> I would have done. And that's what most people would do, right? But right. that's not what they want you to believe that happened, friends. What they want you to believe happened is... Listen to this. <laughs> he ran out that door with his car sitting right there and turned left and went to the edge of the, the building, which was next door, which is Knipe's Amusements. And what they said, this is in the original trial. What they said was that he saw a police car sitting at a stop sign on the other side of the fire station. So the fire, so imagine this, you're in a cluster of buildings. Between it, there's a, a business that does, I think it was like a tow company. There was cars in there and there was a big fence around it and there was billboards on both sides. And then you have the fire station. So they want you to believe that he ran to the corner, saw a police car at the stop sign. It scared him. So he threw all of the evidence on the ground in front of Knight's Amusements, ran and got in his car and drove off. So, and, and yeah, they, <laughs> so, so pretty much he left all the important stuff to incriminate himself right there for everybody to see. That's right. All of it. <laughs> But but let's back up and think about this. This is the thing that's going to really blow your mind. In the court documents, it says that he saw a police car sitting at the stop sign, right? Yeah. Okay. So the interesting thing is this. And Trey and I go, we call it geographic forensics. Right. We actually go around the country and go to places where things happen, read the story and try to understand. And what it does is opens up a whole other world of things that you could, so you don't have to imagine what places look like. You have, you get there and what it really looks like opens up the rest of the story. So the story is this, 
you can't see that stop sign from the edge of Knight's Amusement. You know why? Because Main Street makes a dog leg to the left, a 45 to the left, and the fire station is on the 45. So if he's standing right in front of Knight's Amusements and he's looking that way, he can't see the stop sign. That's in the court documents. So that's not possible or feasible that that's what happened. So that, and that's something that we show you when we're on the bus tour. I show you where the stop sign is and all that kind of stuff. So basically what James O'Ray said happened was that they knew that Martin Luther King was supposed to be on that balcony at six o'clock. The shot was supposed to go off at six o'clock. That was, it was planned for six. Um, and there was a person that would have determined what time he would be on there. And we'll talk about him a little bit later. Um, and it's going to be shocking who this person is when we get to that. But anyway, um, the they want you to believe that James O'Reilly shot, put all of his stuff in a blanket, ran downstairs, left it, and drove off. James O'Reilly said, that him and Raul were in his bedroom. And by the way, his bedroom was on the side of the building where the only way that you could see the Lorraine is you would have to hang out the window with your binoculars and look. Right. But it would have been obscured by that staircase. Remember, there's a distance between those two buildings and his window is behind the staircase that goes right. up to the top. And when you go there, they actually have it where you could step out in a glass box and see the Lorraine, like you're looking at it from the room. They have it where you can step out there. So um, he said that he and Raul were sitting in there and they would occasionally look out the window and they were waiting. And at, at 545, Raul told him somewhere thereabouts, hey, you need to go see if you can get that tire plugged. And when you get back, maybe he'll be here and we can take care of it. So he left and on his way back, he ran. So now we're going to introduce a couple of other guys that were in the trial for Lloyd Jowers. And these guys were also in the, um, uh, somewhat in the first documents, but check this out. So there was two guys that were eating at Jim's Grill. The guy said that he came out between 5.30 and, and 5.45, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. And he walked out and he noticed that cream colored Mustang. And by the way, the color, that Mustang had only been out for two years. So it was a brand new model. And he said that he had never seen one up close. This was his testimony. So he walked, all, his friend didn't get it, forgot his coat. So his friend goes back in to get his coat. While he's doing that, he walks all the way around the car. He said, I got a real good look at it. I even noticed some kind of packages in the back seat that almost looked like cigarette packages. They were colored, red, white, that kind of thing. Maybe Marlboros. And he said, I got a real good look at the car. Then my friend comes out with his coat on and we start walking down the, the block. And these blocks are real city blocks like New York City. They're really, really long. And they're heading to Vance Street, which is where their hotel is at. And he said that somewhere around 545 that they were at the corner of Vance Street and they were getting ready to cross. And as he almost stepped off the curb, that, that Mustang came and turned in front of him on Vance Street. And he said, I'm standing on the driver on the passenger side. So I didn't get a good look at the guy, but I recognized the cigarette pack sitting laying in the back seat as it went by. So I know it was the same car, which corroborates what James O'Reilly said he was doing at 545. He was right. headed to go to the gas station. Now I've tried to figure out which gas station. They never said which gas station in any of the stuff. And what I did was went back and got the list. I took a picture of every gas station in that town in 1968. And I went back and started plotting them on a map. So I have a few suspected gas stations, but I haven't been able to narrow it down and say, this is the one that he went to, but I'm still working on that. Yeah, I was about to say, we got to figure that one out because we know what road he turned on. Yeah. He turned right on Vance off Vance. of Main Street. That's Vance, right. Yeah. And uh, the reason I can remember Vance is my brother's name is Vance. Yeah. It yeah. is Vance. Yeah. And um, so, those guys corroborate what James Earl Ray said later. After all this, they he witnessed him going by, going to get his tire plugged. Okay, so that, that matches up. So what I think happened is they've got someone hired to do the shooting. They walk through Jim's grill, out the back door. And the only way you could get back there, by the way, was through one of the buildings. There was no way to access that area behind Jim's grill 
any other way because if you go to the edge of it, it's a 10 foot tall concrete wall that the, is on the side of the street across from the Lorraine. So if you're standing in the parking lot at the Lorraine, you're looking at the room and you turn around and face the back of Jim's grill, it's a 10 right. foot high concrete wall right there. So he couldn't have accessed it that way. The only way he could do it is coming through the grill. So it had to be something pre-planned. So another interesting thing is if you go back and look at the photographs, there's all kinds of photographs behind Jim's grill where it was, it was uh, basically wrapped up with trash where people had thrown old appliances and there was just trash literally out there stacked up on that little, that little grassy knoll, if you will, behind the, behind the grill. And an interesting thing is the next day, the police department had people come and clean that up. Huh. Yeah. The reason right. that I think that that happened is I think when he shot, you know, when you shoot a rifle, it throws, it ejects the, the bullet casing. I think the bullet casing probably ejected and got caught under something. He couldn't find it. And so they had to go clear it to make sure that that didn't get found is what I believe. Hey, and if you go out there today on that little grassy area, it's and you get down on the ground like you're laying there, which I would suspect a real shooter to be doing. It's right even with, with where the Martin King's mm -hmm. room, uh, the uh, the balcony was. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, it's a straight shot on the ground. It is. It's straight shot on the ground. You have and to now, do that. You have to <clears> another <throat> interesting yeah. thing is the room that he was in is on the corner. So the way it works is, if you could imagine, there's room. Room, room, I think there's three, and it may be just two rooms, and then it turns a corner, and then it goes like that, and there's room, 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 and the and the hotel's long. He was in that corner room, which was what was it, 203, or was it 303? It may have been 303. Um, see if you can find that. Um, but it was the second floor. I think it was 303. I think that the rooms were numbered 100, then the bottom floor was 200, the top floor was 300 from my 306. Memory. 306, okay. So it was, the top floor was 300. So it's 306 on the corner. So that means there's 302, 304, 306, 308, that like that. So there were three rooms and then it goes around a corner. The lady that was staying in 308 was sent home the day before this happened. <laughs> okay, so I believe that that was, so she didn't get shot. So when he got hit, if the bullets went in there, she wouldn't get shot because they would be shooting straight towards her room. You see what I'm saying? From the angle that he's at, he's out on the edge of the balcony. He's shooting straight towards 308. So that's that's one little tidbit. Another little tidbit is that um, Lloyd Jowers said that the guy shot, came in, handed him the gun. He stuck it under the counter. That night, he took it and threw it in the Mississippi River. Yeah. So, of course, somebody should have gone to where Lloyd Jowers threw it in the Mississippi River and tried to recover the, the wet. But to my knowledge, nobody ever did. And sadly, Lloyd's passed, so I don't know where that happened at. But that would be that'd be something interesting to get with his family and see if any of them could tell us. Yeah. But, but diving in the Mississippi River would probably not be very easy to recover something. But, you know, maybe you could do it with magnets, maybe. We just could just know where he stood at when he threw yeah, it. Yeah, when he threw it. And he could have thrown it off the bridge or what, you know, whatever. And so it could be really, really hard to recover. But that's that's what Lloyd said happened. Now, there's some other things that happen. For instance, how who determined that Martin Luther King was going to be in that particular room, literally out on the corner where he would be a target, an easy target? Well, okay. I would imagine... Yeah, who would it be? His friends? So there would have to be somebody in the entourage that would make that call, right? I would think so. Okay, so there is someone that, that y'all know that was in that entourage. His name is Jesse Jackson. <laughs> Jesse Jackson, okay. Okay, and there's there's um, eyewitness testimony that Jesse Jackson was, was telling people to leave at 530. There was wow. a group of guys that were supposed to be their security locally for – for the next march that they did. They were local Memphis guys. And wow. those guys said that he came to their room. Actually, a girl came to the room and knocked first and told them that they needed to go ahead and leave. Then he came to their room and told them that they needed to leave. 
And so they left when all this happened. So what they were trying to do was get rid of potential witnesses, people that could be there that know what went on is what I believe happened. Allegedly reportedly. Um, so, <laughs> so the interesting thing is, is I, somebody in that entourage was who placed him in that room, in that particular room. Okay. That's not something that, so let's talk about odds again. What are the odds that he randomly was in the best room to be killed from where he would walk out on that balcony and they would have a straight shot? What are the odds? And it was a straight shot. It was, I mean, it could, that's a shot that anybody that could shoot a gun can make. I'm telling you guys, you have to go back there to the back to that grass area and lay down like a gunman, somebody that would have shot him back then to, so no one could see him would have done. And you're going to see his room right there in front of you. I'm going to say from the grassy knoll, 130, 140 feet. Would you say that's about right? I would say, yeah. Yeah. I would probably, Not, probably that was a very easy shot with a 30 alt six. Yeah. So another little aspect of it is, so if they were investigating, what I would have done is gone to the to the lady that checked everybody in, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, would yeah. say who placed him in this particular room. Who did you deal with? Right. Yeah. Okay. So that lady, her and her husband, and I don't recall her name, sadly. And her forgive me for that, uh, ma'am. Her name was, I believe, Laura, uh, Lori Bailey. Bailey. Her la it was uh, Walter and Lori. Walter, okay. and, yeah, L O R E E. Okay, so Lori Bailey, Walter and Lori owned the Lorraine Hotel, mm -hmm. and they were a black couple. And Walter worked during the day at one of the nicer hotels, like the Peabody or the, um, I think they, I'm not even going to say the name, maybe a Sheraton. So he worked at a real nice hotel during the day, and at night he would do the maintenance on this hotel and they stayed there specifically because they thought that it would look better if they stayed at a black owned hotel than at the other places that he would usually stay. Okay. Yeah. So what they would have done investigating this is gone to Lori, right? And ask her who told him that. Okay. So guess what happened to Lori? That night she fell out, went into a coma and never woke up. Mm -hmm. and she, she died had three days later. <laughs> She had a stroke. Yeah, that, that night. night. And she died. Uh, I just read it. She died the day of his funeral. Yep. Yep. About three days later. So what are the odds the that only the person that, that would know, know, the only person that would know, she's died, gone. went unconscious that night, that right. night. All right. So the odds of that are just astronomical. All right, so now let me paint you another little picture. I'm going to flip over here to this guy. Um, his name is Frank Holloman. Frank worked, he was over the, he was the, the police and fire director of Memphis in 1968. Yep. So guess what Frank did? He worked for someone from 1949 to 1959. And guess who that person is? <clears throat> 49 to 59. <laughs> Who is it? He ran the office of the FBI for J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover. He worked yeah. for Hoover. Okay. He worked for J. Edgar Hoover. So how many people know an FBI guy that leaves the FBI guy and becomes uh, uh, over a fire and police department in a little podunk town? Right. You see what I'm saying? That's not an FBI thing unless you have reasons for doing that. OK, so a guy that was over the fire department and over the police department worked with J. Edgar Hoover in his office, ran the office for 10 years, the FBI office for J. Edgar Hoover. OK, so he would have been able to determine when people who was working at the fire station. Right. Right. There's testimony in this stuff of a black detective that was at the fire station, him and a white detective were at the fire station and they were up looking through windows at the Lorraine, surveilling it. A guy came in from the FBI and said, Hey, we need you down. Or actually I'm telling you wrong. They called him at the, on the, they called him on the walkie talkie and said, we need you down at the police station ASAP. So he left the black guy, the white guy stayed. He left. 
He went to the police station. The FBI were standing there saying there's been a uh, someone has called in a threat on your life. So we want to go take you to your home, make sure we get your family secured and make sure that nothing happens. And he said that he heard about the assassination on the policeman's radio in his car sitting in front of his house. So they got him out of there. That's right. There was two black firemen that were reassigned a few days before this from that fire department. So there was only white people in that fire department that day. Oh, wow. okay. That's right. Okay. So those things, and guys, the things that I'm telling you are not things I've made up. These are in documents. These are real things. These are real testimonies from people. So um, I want to introduce to you now the guy that would have determined when Martin Luther King is going to be standing on that balcony. That's a guy named Billy Kyles. He's a local preacher, local pastor, the local church, a big church. And Billy Kyles is the one, he was supposed to go to Billy's house that night to eat supper. So Billy shows up to pick him up, okay? And he walks in and he even says, I'm gonna show you a video in a moment. He even says in this video that Pete, and he does it, you know, the Southern preacher, people always ask me, what it was like being the last person to talk to Martin Luther King on the night of his assassination. Well, I tell you, it was preacher talk. You know, it's that kind of stuff. Right, right. So Martin Luther King always um, roomed with a guy named Abernathy, another preacher named Abernathy. So he even says it was it was King, Abernathy, and Kyle's, and we sat down and just talked about preacher stuff, and then. Martin stepped out on the balcony and he was looking down, talking to different people in the courtyard. One of the people that was standing out in the courtyard around the swimming pool, according to testimony, was Jesse Jackson. Okay, so let me find this video. And um, listen to this. And this is, go ahead, Trey. I said, listen to what Spy Guy is about to play for you in a second, because yeah, it's his, the words that he used on accident are very telling. Yeah. And so I'll set this up with this. You know, if you tell a lie, if you tell, let's back up and say this. If you tell the truth, you never have to think about what you said because the truth is always the truth and you have no nothing to hide. So there's nothing going to happen if you always tell the truth. But if you lie and you let your guard down and you start forgetting about it actually being a lie, yeah. there's a point where you might just let it slip out. And this guy, I believe, let it slip out. There it is right there. All right, so I'm going to play this for you. And this is Billy Kyle's. And what happened is he's in a, and this video is actually from um, uh, William Gregory. William Gregory. That's, that's not right. Is that right? Dick Greg. No, Dick Gregory. And so Dick Gregory is showing this in a auditorium because he's saying the same thing that I'm saying about Billy Kyle's. Okay. So you'll hear Dick Gregory's voice in here, but this is what Billy Kyle said about that night. What happened, how it happened and listen closely to what he says. Check this out. Margarita. Okay. You heard what he just said. He said, he was standing here. I was standing there. And only as I moved away so they could get a clear shot, the shot rang out. That's not an accident, friends. He didn't accidentally say that. There's no way that you accidentally say something like that. Can you think of any scenario, Trey, where you could accidentally say that? Only if 
you were meant to uh, step away so uh, the guy could get shot. That's right. So remember what I said. And that even that little thing, so he could get a clear shot, that was a word that they were using or phrase. That was a phrase that they were all using. So, um, so Jesse Jackson had the lady that was in 308 leave, right? Right. uh, Right. Yes. Right. In the room next door that they were shooting towards, had her leave the night before. The guys that were downstairs, that there was a bunch of them in a room, they had all them leave. That was Jesse Jackson, right? Right. The lady that could pin who knew that that uh, that Martin Luther King was going to be on that balcony, or which balcony Martin Luther King would be on, basically. They needed him to be there at that particular spot. You see what I'm saying? Because of the way the angles line up. And the person that would determine what time he would be standing there and that he would still be standing there at 6 o'clock would be Billy Collins. Billy Collins. Right? The guy that you just saw. Now, Billy died about three years ago from my memory. And we drive by his church, by the way, on the bus tour. It's over oh. close to the uh, to the church that Red and Judy got married in, and also, or Red and uh, Pat, and also the 2414 uh, or 1414 yep. Getwell House. It's yep. very close to those houses. So my point is, is when you're looking at all of these different things, they can't be coincidences. It was a a structured, planned thing. Go look up Lloyd Jowers and read the court documents, and you will find that what I've said in this podcast is absolutely factual, all of it. It is testimonies in court. I read it. It's 2,800 pages. It's, it's quite a lot to read, but it's so interesting. I couldn't put it down. And I even went and reenacted um, the him running and getting in the car as opposed to him. Um, Tied up. Thank you. Thank you very much. That means we got three minutes left as opposed to him running and seeing the police and laying all his stuff there. So if you look at it from a standpoint of a making a case against a guy that's a patsy, you can't have a better case than a guy that left all of his fingerprints all over things right there, in, literally with the murder weapon. It's all literally right there. And what kind of person that would have done that d- decided it was the smartest idea for me to put everything in in a, um, a bed sheet, take it outside instead of jumping in my car that's right in front of me so I can get out of there and head to Atlanta before anybody sees me. He decides to go and, and throw place this bed sheet with a gun and all of his stuff right there where the police can find it right in the middle, uh, right out on main street in Memphis, Tennessee. Yes. And it may have been, by the way, I'm saying bed sheet. It may have been a blanket, but it this was, is, I thought it was kind a, of a blanket sheet. looking thing more. It was thicker than a bed sheet. Okay. But my question was this, was it the bed sheet from that room? And the answer is no, it was not. So they so, even brought that with them. You see what I'm saying? You know, uh, a run uh, a escaped convict is not hauling extra blankets around that he can wow. use to wrap his stuff up in. You see what I'm saying? So I just, I just, know, I just know that if you know when when you visit Memphis, you have to go here and go back to that back grassy area and get down on that grass and look to room 306. And tell me that I'm not telling you that it's right there in front of you. Perfect, clear shot for that. And I don't know when this show is going to air, but if it's before August the 10th through 16th, you could join Spy Guy and I on a three-hour bus tour, part one, and we will take you to out front and show you the door that we talked about where the staircase is, show you where his car was parked, show you the corner where this moron decides to leave all my evidence so everybody in the world can know that I'm the one that did it for everybody to sit fine if that really happened. We're, and so get your tickets at memphisbustier.com if this is before August the 10th or 16th. Absolutely. And, uh, you'll well, see another, it. With- another thing to think about is the, um, the where he left all that – if he'd have just taken that stuff and put it in his car and left, they'd have never figured out who it was. <laughs> they would have never. Unless he told somebody, they would have never figured it out. He'd have been so, gone, my guy. 
either this guy is the dumbest criminal in the world or he was set up. Like you said, he came back from the gas station. He saw the cops and he said, man, I ain't doing this. He takes a U-turn and he heads to Atlanta, Atlanta. And in the meantime, he is set up with that evidence that was yeah, their whole game. That, that, that so makes sense. We're right at the edge of time, but I wanted to bring up one more little tidbit. So the JFK assassination, I believe, was a government hit just like this one was a government hit. Now, I have a lot of people that are my friends that I have a particular friend that is a JF or a JFK assassination expert. But he thinks that that Lee Harvey Oswald was the long gunman. But I'll leave you with this, something to ponder. Let's go back to probably one of the most famous assassinations from way back. Let's go back to Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So did John Wilkes Booth go to Abraham Lincoln or did Abraham Lincoln go to John Wilkes Booth? John Wilkes Booth went to Ford Theater where Abraham Lincoln was. That's right. So that's one that went. He physically went to his target, right? Right. Okay. John Lennon did, uh, what's the guy, Larry, da uh, Mark, Mark David Chapman. Is it, I, may be, I think that's right. Mark David Chapman. Did he go to, to Lennon or did Lennon come to him? He went to Lennon. Okay. So um, RFK, Robert F. Kennedy. Did Sirhan Sirhan go to him or did he come to, to Sirhan Sirhan? No, he went to the, uh, to the event that Kennedy was at. That's right. So did Kennedy go to the sniper or did the sniper come to Kennedy? Kennedy went to the sniper. Okay. So think about this. And also, so let's talk about MLK. Did the sniper go to MLK or did he come to the sniper? Sniper went to MLK at the Lorraine. Okay. And I feel like that we know based off of the preponderance of the evidence that that was a hit, a government hit. In fact, if you go look at the Lloyd Jowers trial, they found the Memphis City Police, the fire department, the CIA, the FBI, all guilty in the trial, all mm -hmm. implicated in the trial. Y'all have never heard that before. Yeah, by everything. It's out there. Okay. And it's easy to find. Yep. So let's let's talk about the, the JFK thing. So at in 1963, there was about a half a million people that lived in Dallas. Roughly. Right. You got one guy crazy enough to shoot the president with a gun and a half a million people. And he just happened to drive to that one guy. Right. The odds to, of that are astronomical. And I just don't believe that it was a happenstance. Tighten up, friends. And I'm sorry my beard is so scruffy. I've had some back issues and I haven't been able to stand up enough to, to even shave, but I'm getting better. Trey, I enjoyed this, my friend. And well, you know, Billy, like you said before you go, I uh, like what you presented today and other stuff and what you told me, and then you backed it up with the files, something else happened than what the history is being told. And, and that's not, and that sucks for Martin Luther King Jr. But he knew that it was going to happen. Yeah, but his speech the day before, go listen to that famous speech and just listen to those words because he told the crowd that he may not get there with them. He knew something he knew. was up. Mm -hmm. He knew something was up. He's a brave man. I have, you know, I have to give him that. He was brave because they killed him. Um, and I believe that that edict came down from, from Hoover. And I believe uh, from the FBI and Hoover. And I believe that that edict came down from Hoover and all them as well in the JFK thing. I think that was a hit as well. Yeah. So tighten up, friends. Thank you for listening. And we'll see y'all next time.